welcome you this Friday evening to a fantastic lecture by the renowned architect Mick Pierce. It has been my pleasure to work with Mick to arrange this lecture for you this evening. He has been understanding and patient with the crazy schedule of an architecture student, which I'm sure he can recall from his own experience all those years ago. Mick is speaking to us for di us today from the distant land of Zhongguan, China, in the Yunnan province. Over the course of his career, Mick has focused upon the development of buildings which have low maintenance, low capital, and running costs, and renewable energy systems of environmental control. Mick has also become increasingly interested in the development of a new relationship between the city and nature, especially during a time when man's relationship with nature is changing. Kim, I'm not hearing you. Oh. Uh, something, you there's something wrong with your mic. Is that better? Uh, right. That's better, yeah. His work has taken him around the globe. He has designed buildings in his homeland of Zimbabwe, as well as Australia, the United mm -hmm. Kingdom, and Belgium. He prefers to stay in the place where the building is being built, because that way he gets a better feel of the place. Although he can design remotely, it has never quite worked out properly. Mick has become, in his own words, sort of a one-man band migrant worker. He does all of his own drawing, drawings in freehand sketches as well as models. He is fearless in the face of new opportunities and to adapt to the changing times, has taught himself 3D AutoCAD at the young age of 74. Mr. Pierce started making waves in, within the architecture community with the completion of the Eastgate, de Eastgate development in 1996, located in Harare, Zimbabwe. Probably another thunderbolt. <laughs> They're having a, a thunderstorm over there, so we'll just wait, more or less. <laughs> so that's the unfortunate part of broadcasting all the way from the future. Things get a little bit mixed up. You remember back to the future, all the lightning that they have to have. So anyway, um, we'll just give it a pause. But we're thankful that you all came here. <laughs> and he's got a really nice slide presentation to, to accompany things. I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's, uh, my roommate. Ah, we're back. Yes, was it another thunderbolt? Yeah, I've put the dongle on as well now, so we've got two interconnect connections. Okay. I don't know what happened, it just went... Anyway, we're on a dongle as well now, so oh, okay. we should be alright. Alrighty, okay. so, um, picking up, um, Mick started making waves uh, with the completion of the Eastgate development in 1996, located in Harare, Zimbabwe. He studied how the indigenous termites constructed their homes to maintain a constant temperature within the colony. This, 
This practice of taking inspiration from nature's processes and utilizing them in buildings goes by many names, such as bionics and biomimicry. Unfortunately, the 2000 Zimbabwe elections resulted in great instability within the country. This unrest caused Mick to take up residence in Melbourne, Australia. With his change of address, he was presented with the opportunity to lead the design team with the, in the construction of the Council House 2 project in Melbourne, Australia. Mick Pierce approached the design of the, this mixed-use building conscious of the balance between the natural, the social, and economic environments in which the project is cited. Now his design has taken him to China, where he talks to us from today. His work as an innovator has begun to challenge the long-standing notions that architecture and nature have little to learn from one another. Much like Louis Sullivan, author of the motto, Form Follows Function, we find ourselves at the beginning of a new century, burgeoning with new technologies. Perhaps Sullivan's phrase needs to be adapted for a new age, becoming instead, form follows process. In this lecture, Mick hopes to demonstrate through his architecture that he's followed this dictum and uh, form follows process. Please join me in welcoming the esteemed architect, Mick Pierce. Okay, good, good. And we'll turn the lights down. Is that fair enough? Yeah, that's fine. I'll just say next for the next slide, okay? Okay, sounds good. Can you hear me all right? Okay. No, no, that's fine. That's perfect like it is. That's all I need. Okay. Oh, no, you, no, no, you pull yours through full screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There. Oh, then that's fine. All right. That's it. Good. Okay. Yeah. When you're ready. Okay, next. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to go through these slides. You, you've got a copy of the whole presentation. And the notes on, are, are below the slide, so, you know, if you want to sort of get into anything, um, take a copy of the presentation and then you can examine it later. Because there's so much stuff here, I don't want to sort of spend hours reading it. I'm just going to talk to you over, over the slides. The, the, this is, a, you know, this is really about biomimicry and why Velcro came from, um, uh, from this plant. Um, uh, so, but I, I want to take it into architecture. Next slide. Um, have you got that one? Three. Slide three. That's it. Th this, this picture, which I dug out of a book, um, was drawn by Vitruvius. And what, what's fascinating to me is, is that he reckoned fire created human society. Um, and, you know, you can believe that very easily. Um, so, in a way, Vitruvius is our first green architect, um, and the connection with nature is evident. Um, the fire uh, produces, uh, modifies the climate and gives us light into the darkness. Um, and, and obviously, um, it's, it's animated earth, it's, it's, it's people and, and nature together. Um, the next slide, I'm just going to go through them quite quickly. Um, is the Oculus and uh, the Pantheon, my favorite building, which in a way is an expression of, of um, a connection with nature in, in the most dramatic form you can imagine. Um, and I was fascinated with this and I took it, I tried to get a, a building to work like it, uh, which you'll see on the next slide. Um, sorry, the next slide is, is, a, is a, a little cartoon, my attempt to try and um, uh, define process, or process, as you say in America, as opposed to object. Um, when you're looking at nature, um, which I'll show you later, um, you can't understand it until you think of uh, what you're looking at as a process and not an object. You've got to get away from objectifying things. Um, and that's what this, the, so the, the children's drawing of the house with the chimney uh, when the smoke comes out the chimney, it becomes architecture. It involves energy. So next slide. 
um, will show you a building which I tried, um, this was a competition um, for, for an exhibition hall in Doha. I didn't win it, but um, the idea was to take the Pantheon uh, idea and put in the eye, in the eye was actually, uh, next slide, um, uh, based on the human eye. Uh, it was a, an idea I borrowed from a, a, a scientist who had patented this uh, solar furnace, which had a, the lens and the retina, and it, followed, it tracked the sun. And the, the idea was that this um, eye would track the sun, um, creating energy during the day, and then at night it would turn and face space and become a dew collector, which you get in Doha. Doha is, 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 has high humidity, particularly at night. And if you have a shiny surface um, facing space, you can actually get condensation and dew. So there, there was a sort of animated version of, of um, biomimicry. Uh, next slide. Um, I've defined the process, which is more or less what I've said earlier. Um, and it, it, it actually it clicked uh, for me when Scott Turner was talking to me over the telephone. I start, Scott Turner is a physiologist. He lectures in uh, one of your universities. Uh, and he is the, uh, he's one of the great experts on, on termites. Um, and he, he explained to me over the phone that, you know, he couldn't understand what it was that he was looking at until he saw it as an earth fountain. In other words, a process, not an object. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, now, I then got into earth sciences in a big way. When I, I started reading the stuff in the late 80s, um, I was already 10, 10 years behind. Um, next slide. And this is, the, I think I'm on slide 10, that's it. Um, this is really, um, Lovelock and Margulis, um, and what um, what was great? Well, there are two there are two things about this slide. One of them is, of course, um, the difference between the foreground and the rising earth. It's an astonishing photograph, um, and you know it 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 for me is 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 really the the, the essence of of everything um, about earth science, um, and. Um, Lovelock's great gift to earth science is, um, is this uh, um, discovery of DMS, um, the discovery that um, a tiny little, this, this little fellow, the coccolithophore, co um, uh, actually produces DMS, and um, that uh, combines with oxygen um, and forms um, a nuclearization of clouds. And that's how clouds are formed. Without them, we wouldn't get clouds. We get a different format uh, altogether. Um, and it's the cloud cover that then reflects the sunlight back to space and controls temperature. This is one of the one of the great um, ways that that animal that life controls Earth's, uh, particularly sea surface temperatures. Um, and that you know that's that's what that was his great gift. Um, and I, I find that absolutely amazing, and, and it's a process. Next slide. Um, and then, of course, there's the carbon cycle. So we begin, the carbon cycle, I won't go into it, it's a, it's a long story, but basically it's happening very dramatically in Indonesia at the moment, um, where you're getting um, calcium carbonate being forced into m the magnum and coming out in the form of CO2 through the volcanoes. I mean, the whole, the whole, uh, process is happening in Indonesia. Um, and it's originally come, the calcium carbonate has come from the, from the forests and, and then from the sky, so that you can see the whole uh, carbon cycle very dramatically. Um, next slide um, is uh, um, borrowed from Scott Turner's book um, in which he has mapped the six life forms and their arrival on the planet and how they've affected oxygen levels, um, the cranobacteria being the, the, the oxygen, original oxygen producer. And plants and animals um, come right down at the end, in, end of the scale in 600 million years only. Uh, next slide um, shows the um, rise and fall of the sea. 
which uh, changes the real estate on the planet. Um, so you get this picture of life um, and combined with um, what uh, uh, Stephen Harding calls the animate earth. So all the animals, sorry, that was a clap of thunder that nearly knocked me off my chair just now. Um, uh, the, the, the earth sure is animated. Next slide. Is the heartbeat. Um, now you know all this stuff because you get, get it rammed down your throats but, um, these days. But um, to me what's interesting about this slide is that 10,000 years ago you can see the effect of European agriculture on the heartbeat, the planet heartbeat, that dip. It's, um, it's begun to affect climate. So humans really started um, affecting climate um, quite dramatically 10,000 years ago. Next slide. Um, so we go to the social environment and our modern lifestyle and um, track the next slide, which is um, the, um, about fire again and how when we were agriculturalists, uh, early agriculturalists, pre-industrial, um, we used fire, and we, it was kind of uh, part of our consciousness, um, and we we kind of knew and understood um, the carbon cycle. Uh, next, uh, and then we moved into industry, away from water, towards through steam, and finally to electricity. And the fire has, has disappeared into the engine. Next. And then finally, the story that I, I show in China, um, where it's very worrying, we have a rising middle class. Um, uh, very exciting, very um, positive and, and inspiring, but um, uh, there are problems. This, this was a bit of work done in, in America, actually, one of your universities, where they tried to map the rainforest or the coral reef um, with the six life forms um, and uh, it, it, they try to tie in the modern um, lifestyle or the, or the middle class lifestyle. Uh, next slide. Uh, that explains it. If you're a, um, that woman on the previous slide, imagine her um, in, as Eve walking around in the, in the rainforest uh, without any tools. She, she has a, a metabolic rate of about 100 watts. Um, give her tools, she becomes a sort of peasant farm worker. She gets, a, she, she scores about 300 watts, and then you give her the lifestyle of the middle class. It's 11,000 watts, and the next slide um, shows that she's about the same as a 40-ton mammal. So we've got, and in China, we're heading towards 20% uh, of the population living uh, with this star. Next. Um, and then I, I worked out, uh, looking out of my flat here, that if you took 12 street sweepers and, work, and gave them the normal daily wage here um, and reckoned that they would do the work of one machine cleaning the streets, um, uh, they, would have, they would work um, for one year um, to achieve the same work done by a machine uh, consuming one barrel of oil um, and therefore the real price of a barrel of oil should be about um, RMB 518 <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and not anything like what it is. Next slide. Um, the next slide is where we are in Zimbabwe where um, innovation has taken over um, with, with lack of oil. But we're heading towards uh, an oil crisis. Okay, next slide. Now, I, I then move into um, Zimbabwe and, and into the Eastgate project. Um, and I was inspired by David Attenborough's BBC Life series. Next. Uh, and so I started looking at termites. Now, again, I, I saw them differently then. I, I, I saw this, this uh, funnel. Uh, coming out of the ground, and I thought that's that's got to be um, stack effect. If you the, the night temperature is, uh, is is much lower, and so you get a stack effect at night. 
and that must give them more oxygen. So they must be night workers. But in fact, they're working during the day. Um, and it's very curious to, to, to kind of understand what's going on here. But um, all the little uh, funnels face the same way, the same direction. They're all orientated to the north, like the little diagram. Um, so there's, there's, a, um, there's something really quite different going on. Next slide. Um, and again, I, as I said before, you've got to see it as a process and not as, a, as an object. So get away from this, this funnel idea. Um, Scott Turner's been trying to get me off it for a long time. Next. Uh, and the next series of slides I'm not going to describe because you can study them on the web. And it's absolutely fascinating. But Scott Turner and, and Rupert Sauer have done this work in Namibia with, with the termites. And they have proved that that thing that sticks out the ground is a lung. It's a breathing system. And it is powered by turbulent winds and sunshine. And of course, there is some stack effect. Next. Um, and this is their analysis. I went, it's very complicated. I wouldn't attempt to describe it to you over this, over the sky. Next. Uh, I, I'll go on to 28. Um, slide 28 shows how the, the, they farm the, um, the fungi. Um, so that there again, the fungi, uh, the, the whole history of fungi is amazing because they, uh, I, I didn't, I skipped that in my um, map of, of the history of the planet. But the fungi appeared about 75 million years before plants. And without them, plants wouldn't have happened. Um, so, it, and, and here, the fungi are actually doing the digestive process for the, for the termites, just as bacteria digest our food. Uh, next, get to 29. There's a picture of, of how... Have you, sorry, you're, you're ahead of me, I think. Go, go to slide 29. Sorry. Uh, that's it. That's it. Perfect. Um, now, when um, Rupert... Uh, uh, dissected, he filled one of these um, termite mounds in Namibia with um, plaster of Paris and then sprayed off the mud. And what he got was an endocast, uh, you know, a, a negative model. Um, and it looked exactly, it's the same structure as our lungs. So when they said it's a lung, you know, it, 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 you, you really begin to, to think um, the surface of the, of the mound is actually a membrane, just like the, the skin around our lungs is a membrane. Um, and it, it's, it's all about gas diffusion. Um, in, in, in our case, powered by muscles. But in this case, it's powered by turbulent air and sunshine. And they've also demonstrated that the, uh, the actual mound sort of leans towards the sun the average um, uh, line of the sun. Um, and it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, that, I won't go into it now, but, but that, that's what it is. So really, the, the, the mound is, is, a, is a lung at the top, and then underneath, below ground, is the stomach and, and, the, and the womb. So it is a body. And, and put it all together, and you've got a, a metabolic system um, about the same as a goat. Um, okay, let's go to slide 30. Uh, it's just the last one of that series. Okay. And then, that, that, so that's all explained in the notes and, in, in, and on the web if you're really interested. But it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I put them in because um, the next slide, 31, can you get to 31? There we are. Um, really, it, 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 I put in red the sort of um, concepts that really excite me. The extension of the metabolism. That the house or the nest is an extension of the metabolism. Um, it's part of the body. The body extends. And then I started looking at all sorts of things. If you get, I was on the site at CH2 
watching this machine um, dig a hole and the driver uh, was treating it like his, his hand. Um, and just to show off, he, he watched me, uh, curious, and we talked about this before. Um, so he, he, th th this, this, uh, this arm uh, of his uh, picked up uh, a beer bottle on the side of the site and he put it right next to me uh, just to show off. And, you know, you could see that that was an extension of, of the metabolism. Okay. Are you still there? Okay. Um, the, the, uh, let's go to slide, the next slide, which is 32. Okay. Um, now, I, I want to um, take you to Zimbabwe uh, and talk about, CH, about, about Eastgate. Um, the, this slide really combines, is a combination. The top left, it shows the dry season and the wet season, quite different. We have about nine months of cool and, and dry, followed by about three months of wet and damp. Um, it's a high altitude, it's rather like Mexico, about the same latitude too, and about the same altitude. Um, and then below, left, bottom left, is Great Zimbabwe, where you'll see a, a huge stone wall, which is about three, meet, three stories high uh, and, a, and about a story thick. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's 16 meters thick, and it's made of stone. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's built uh, like we built a temple uh, for, to impress. It's not for defense. Uh, it's much more for prestige. Um, and inside it are um, the remains of dwellings. Um, in fact, uh, this was um, a huge settlement of people. I mean, it was a town in those days, uh, built probably about between 1100 and 1500 um, AD. Uh, and it means that they were living in one place long enough to worry about building in stone. Whereas most uh, Bantu tribes moved with uh, the ecosystem when the, the, their cattle um, uh, really had, had, had dissolved uh, what was uh, dissolved the ecosystem. They had, they had to move on. Um, their houses were made of sticks and mud, and, and they were much more temporary. But here they had a system going, the Shona people, um, of um, moving their cattle with the seasons. So in other words, they, they had a kind of um, much more harmonious relationship with nature. And this rem these remarkable buildings, the, the Zimbabwean, uh, Zimbabwean, it means house of stone. And there are quite a lot of them all over the country, but this is the main one. Um, on, the, on the right is quite clearly a, a picture of the rocks um, in the corner there. And you can see that they worshipped them, and the, they, they made carvings. So these rocks, actually, these granite rocks, um, have been animated, if you like. Um, so that, that to me, is, is nature and humans working together. Um, next slide. Um, I think is, uh, let's see. Uh, so there's the hot and wet season. And then I just wanted to show you the next slide, which is, um, uh, that's better. Uh, th th this one, um, which is 34, yeah. Um, it is astonishing to me to see rock, to see um, the, the trees growing out of granite. And there you have a picture of the vital um, stage, the beginning of the carbon cycle. The trees are absorbing carbon dioxide from the air, um, and that they're turning that into biomass. The, their roots are cracking up the rocks, and so is the lichen cracking up the surface of the rocks. So granite um, plus um, carbon carbonic acid is turning into um, calcium carbonate eventually, and that runs down to the sea in in in, uh, in the rivers and forms. 
um, what we get, it, it forms limestone, it forms sediments, it, it, it produces the corals. So the whole process there is all happening. Um, and the one on the right shows how the rocks are affected by the diurnal shift. So you have, because you have the, 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 uh, the, the diurnal shift at night, diurnal shift is the difference in temperature between day and night. Um, and that can, yeah? Yeah? Sorry. Sorry. Is that better? Sorry. Um, it, it, it should be close to my mouth. That's better. Yeah. Um, so you, you, get, you get this rock splitting. Now, if you turn to the next slide, 35, um, you can see that expressed in the wall of Great Zimbabwe. Um, they found a way of building by removing the layers of rock um, from the quarry um, that have been split by the, by, by, the, by the diurnal shift and putting them in the same order that they come off the rock onto the wall. And that way they get the coursing right. Um, if you don't do that, you find it's very much more difficult to course. Uh, and you can see this in the whole process of building Great Zimbabwe, which went over 500 years. And in the later half, you can see how they they'd got, got it right. Um, this to me was wonderful. And then you can see the rock leech and painting the, the rock. So in a way, in a way that, that to, to me is, is the perfection of, of, um, of the kind of architecture I'm trying to get. Um, okay, next slide, 36, we go into Harare. And th these are the buildings I was building. This, now we're, we're about 86. Uh, 1986, I returned from England where I had been running a, a building cooperative and I returned home um, in a new independent country and um, there was a lot of money around in savings so there was a building boom and uh, this, this, uh, the top left is, is the first office block uh, first job I got really, big job um, and in it, we, we, uh, I persuaded the client to put in a, a, a courtyard. Um, and in the courtyard, we put plants. Uh, we also sun shielded the building. Um, before that, they didn't seem to sun shield much. Uh, the thing is that it, the climate is very benign. But most of the heat in the summer comes from the sun. Um, it, it, the skies are very clear, so you get huge solar gain during the day and then it, it gets cool at night so the, the courtyard fills up with cold air um, and uh, like a reservoir because it's heavier um, and then um, it, it, uh, it, that's where we suck in the air for the air conditioning but if you put plants in it you can drop that temperature by at least four degrees between four and seven degrees just for the plants um, uh, so that was one thing I found. Then, then um, the late, later buildings, um, this was the university building below, which uh, is open. Most of the communication space um, are colonnades. In that climate, it works perfectly. Next. Uh, so, so colonnades are a way of getting around. Forget about the corridor. Slide 37 um, is the... Um, an, an office block I, I built uh, after the, the first one um, and it was an H form and we decided this was not air conditioned and it was um, naturally ventilated uh, and this is an H plan uh, which has these um, chunks cut, cut out of it so that you get cross ventilation through all the offices um, and then we put gardens um, floating up in, in these um, in, in, in goes, um to, to modify the the, uh, the air coming in um, right, and, and then I put my office in it and quite frankly it didn't work very well uh, I couldn't get people to open the windows at night to get a night flush uh, they'd always forget it and in any case there was a lot of dust and, and, and mess from the from the town and of course during the day you didn't want the noise 
So air conditioning is, is really on. You can't get away from it. Um, in fact, this building had the option of air conditioning, but they were split units, which you put on the, on the um, third floor intervals. On, on, on the vertical rise. So in some ways it was, it was uh, successful, but not, not, not great. Uh, and it taught me a lot about, about office buildings. Um, and it, we, so we switched to the next slide, which is 38. And that's Eastgate. Um, now, th there's a lot between Eastgate and the, and the former slide, but um, uh, basically uh, I had been building for one client and uh, in this case he said, look, Mick, we, 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 we want to do a building without air conditioning um, because it's too expensive to import the machinery and energy prices are going up like crazy here. Um, and it's such a benign climate, we don't need air conditioning. And I, uh, I said, yes, that's absolutely right, we don't need air conditioning. I'll design your building that works without air conditioning and works entirely on, on using the diurnal shift. Now, I'd, I'd thought about this before um, with, uh, with a colleague um, and um, it just happened that at that time I, I, I watched this um, video with, with um, um, Attenborough wandering around inside the termite's nest in, in uh, northern Nigeria. And it clicked, you know, something coming about thermal mass, the, the stack effects, um, and, and night cooling. Um, it all came together. Now, the next slide shows really um, how my thinking was in those days. I saw it quite simply as a chimney, um, and that at night, because the night air cooled down to about 14 degrees, and the inside nest had to remain at 31 at least to keep the um, fungi alive and the fungi were part of the process that had to um, that had to digest their food and so on. So the, the internal um, temperature, in fact it's not nearly as, um, as sensitive to temperature difference now we found. Uh, humidity is much more important so they need constant humidity so they have a way of varying their, their temperature um, uh, and, to keep, and, and keeping the humidity levels exactly in, in, in check. Um, but in those days I just saw it as a, as a very simple uh, chimney. Um, and luckily I did because to try and emulate what was going on in, in a termite's nest um, in, a, in, a, in a human um, uh, extended metabolism uh, was, was, was something else completely. So I kept, I kept it simple and I put chimneys on the building. Now, uh, the next slide you'll see the plan, the plan of the building, which is quite simple. It's two office blocks on either side of a street and um, there's a core running through uh, each office block and the core contains the toilets, but also ducts that, that occur um, at intervals um, in, in, in the spine. And then between the two blocks there are bridges linking them together. And the yellow dots on those bridges are, um, that's these if you can see my uh, name, I can't see my point, the, are, the, are the lifts. And then the line, the spine, you'll see this a bit clearer in the section, uh, is what we call the, the skywalk that links the bridges together at the bottom level. So it's really two um, enormous buildings on either side of the street. Um, next slide, um, and which shows the section. That's 41. Can you switch? That's it. Uh, so the section through the building is a nine story, each, each uh, block is nine stories, a shop below and car parking underneath. Um, and there are nine floors of offices and at intervals in the length, which the top section shows, there are chimneys running right through the offices um, and they combine at the top level um, 
to form uh, real chimneys that stick up above the roof. Um, and what's happening is that at night, um, you get uh, the outside air temperature drops down to 14. The inside is still at 25, 26, probably 28. Um, and so you get really good stack effects, which helps the fans. The fans are blowing air from the bottom through the building to the top. So you get stack effect helping the fans. Um, and the fans simply blow night cool air through the building and cool down the whole structure. And the way that the air runs is up the middle um, of the building in this, in this duct goes up um, and connects to each floor. Each floor is a sort of um, heat exchange. Um, um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, and then the, the air circulates through the office and, and out of the top of the office and up the exhaust. So um, uh, you can see the next slide, um, which, which shows how that works. You see that gap in the, in the floor. Um, the air is pushed through that gap, comes out under the window, and then is heated by human activity and computers and people. Um, and then it rises up. Now, um, uh, that is uh, air cooling. But also, the, the ceiling um, above uh, your sea is, um, is a, a heat absorber. So it's, it's concrete um, exposed. Um, now, um, so the next slide. Um, shows how the floor works. Uh, it, it, the floor is hollow and it has these teeth. And we found that just by blowing air through those teeth, um, cool air, you would get a four um, degree cooling effect just by cooling those teeth with night air and, uh, and then simply blowing air through the next day, you'd, you'd be able to get the equivalent of, of um, four degrees of cooling inside the offices after you've added the heat from people and, and machines. So it was looking good. Uh, we actually built a full-scale model of, of this before we built the building. Uh, next. Next slide is, is the ceiling. Um, and we were very careful to, that we had rather primitive lights. Those were actually fluorescent tubes, not T5s as I'm using now. And the heat from them um, shone into the vaults uh, that we formed. The vaults and the ceiling um, occurred um, on pit partition lines because it had to be flexibly partitioned. This was not an open plan office, it was really a partitioned office. Um, and the air, the, the hot air goes through those holes at the bottom end of, of, each, um, of each vault. Okay, next slide. Um, I've thrown these in because the process of making this building is very important. We made everything in small precast units. Um, and th these are actually the tops of the chimneys, you see. Uh, next. Um, and we, we were careful to choose um, granite. And what I wanted to do was to, was to com copy Great Zimbabwe and try and get granite looking like, sorry, try and get the concrete looking like granite. So we, we used ancient granite stone and, and also oh, sand, granite sands, and mixed them to get the right color. Next. Um, and then we, we developed a, a form system. Um, these were steel forms, uh, very primitive looking things. But the whole idea of the form work to make a precast unit was that you could strike the form while the concrete was still green and brush its surface. And so you could get this granite uh, texture on the outside. Um, so these forms are actually are very remarkable. They're, they're still sort of kicking around in the bush somewhere. Um, next. Uh, but you can see there was a huge precasting yard where we made all these bits. There were 440,000 uh, units. Um, they couldn't be bigger than this uh, because we hadn't got the cranage to lift anything bigger. Uh, next. Now, um, I showed this picture, which obviously comes from Arizona, I think, um, of the cactus. 
because that inspired the architecture in a way. What I wanted was a prickly building to emulate what happens in the desert with desert plants and how they disperse heat. Um, they, they, the, the prickles um, are, are inefficient at absorbing heat and very efficient at dispersing heat at night. And uh, that shows up on the next slide. So if you design a smooth uh, dome-like building, it'll be good at absorbing heat and um, inefficient at dispersing it at night, whereas a prickly one works the other way. So it's just like the, you know, the, um, the, the, the thermal um, uh, block on a, on a motorbike. Uh, the cooling. Next. Um, and that's what produced this strange looking architecture with, of prickles. Um, rather, rather dramatic. Um, but it's, it's, it's sort of, it, when it first went up, everybody thought I was mad, but it's kind of, kind of uh, getting, getting there now. Next. You can see the detail. Um, now, it all came actually from uh, a, a, a famous uh, French architect, Ledoux, uh, and I think there's a slide of his work, but it, it's very romantic stuff. Um, the, th th that's the elevation facing the sun, um, either the south or the north. We're on latitude 15, so we actually do get um, sunshine from the south as well as the north. Uh, and all we did was to change the length of the protruding um, sun shield. And then I introduced plants. At, like, like um, I'm not in favor of this green wall stuff. I'd, I'd like to see the plants forming um, architecture in some way. So these are actually green columns that, that occur on the grid. Uh, next slide, I think, shows them uh, perhaps a bit better, 554, yeah. Um, now that, so you get the cooling effect of um, of plants and the uh, prickly effect of of the, and it gives you a, a very um, very dramatic elevation. Uh, next, uh, and that's what inspired it, which is Ledoux. And you can see Ledoux's uh, rustication on on the Royal Saline in, in North France. Absolutely amazing building, and you can see my I've more or less copied him exactly, but I, I added the green stuff. Okay, uh, next. Um, and then we, we uh, I was fascinated with, with Shana um, architecture, which is really in the form of furniture. Um, and you can see that reflected in the next slide, um, which is the staircase. Um, so there had to be some um, Shana, or at least a reference to traditional architecture. Next, um, and then the, the next slide is really the, the shop and the offices above. This was something that um, was, was worrying to a lot of people. Can you mix retail and, and uh, commercial uh, and all the security problems? Well, this actually works very well because um, you're always overlooked if you happen to be a thief walking up and down the, the street. You're always overlooked uh, from above, so it's it's a very defensible space. Uh, and what's turned out to be a really good plan is to put the lifts and the um, corridors over the street instead of inside the buildings on each side. Uh, you get a much more dramatic street. Um, you don't have to air condition the the spaces occupied by people walking. Um, and, and which don't need air conditioning. Um, so it, it, and you get this hugely positive um, sort of animated streetscape, which, which works vertically as well as horizontally. Next. Um, you can see a picture of there better, perhaps. Um, so there's the guard watching uh, the people below. I, I mean, this is particularly good because I ran we ran two elections from this building. My, my offices are on the eighth floor. And uh, Morgan Sangarai, the, the opposition leader, who's a good friend of mine, um, had my office uh, as his election base. 
during the two uh, very violent um, elections in Zimbabwe, um, and, and, uh, during which we were attacked quite frequently by Mugabe's troops. Um, and it was very easy for us to, to defend our position at the, at the top level. Next. Um, that's just about combining the sort of stone architecture with the steel architecture. Next. Um, and, and the top, over the street, we just put an umbrella of glass with open sides. So you get, uh, what you get is a, a, um, the glass actually heats up, heats up the air. So you, you get um, convected air pulled out of the street, which is, works quite well, um, except in winter when it's actually a bit cold in there. But during the summer, it's great. Next. Uh, and you can see the, the we used to be, uh, there's a lot of mining going on uh, in Southern Africa. So there was a lot of, um, it was easy to get cables and do suspended bridges. You'll see that whole structure uh, of the streets and the, and the, um, the, the uh, lifts is all suspended from great iron, iron girders going across to keep the ground floor free of columns to keep the street open at the bottom. Next. Uh, that's a sort of day and night picture. So it's very much a day and night building. Um, and and it, it, it doesn't try to look different. Uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't try to, to um, escape the night. Um, so the two are quite, quite distinctly dramatic. Um, next. Uh, and that's the result. You can see the, the red line uh, is the day and night diurnal shift. Each zigzag is a day and a night. And the yellow line is, is, is the, um, uh, uh, that's the concrete slab temperature. And then the blue line is the average um, internal temperature. And you can see how the, the concrete modifies the internal temperature from the diurnal shift and you get about four degrees of cooling as we uh, designed originally from a diurnal shift of 12 degrees um, and it's purely by changing the air flow rates during the night uh, of about 10 air changes and you switch to about two air changes during the day uh, which is enough for ventilation and, and you can then spread out the cooling effect over the whole day, particularly in the afternoon. But you can vary that, that timing very simply. And the result was the yellow uh, column is, is the amount of energy that uh, Eastgate uses compared with uh, six other buildings that we, we tracked. This was done by an independent uh, consultant. So it, it does work. Um, in, in, in respect to energy, it saves about, it, it used about 10% of the energy that a normal air conditioning building would, would have used in, in that environment. Next. Uh, and the next slide shows how we took it further with a little school for an uh, international school. Um, and uh, we had very nice uh, clients from, from America actually, um, who were very keen on, on this sort of development. Uh, and so we tried um, using rock um, stores. Now this is simply blowing cold night air through rocks in a cage, um, cooling them down, and then using those rocks to cool the air the next day. So it's a very simple system. Um, and it works even better than, than Eastgate. Um, we, we were getting eight degrees of cooling in a full classroom of kids. Um, uh, and it is uh, from a 12 degree night shift. So it, 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 it works actually more efficiently than, um, than Eastgate, where we're just using those teeth. And we also added, as you see in the top right of this multiple slide, uh, is, a, is a diagram showing that the, the rock in pink, um, being, uh, and the air is blown through the rocks, and then there's an added a little bit of evaporative cooling on the other side, uh, which drops it another uh, couple of degrees. So the total was, was eight degrees of cooling from 12 degrees of 
diurnal shift. And this, this uh, building happened to be a, an, um, an art center. Um, it was a, a theater, and um, all this happened underneath the foyer uh, of the theater. And then uh, on the top of the building, we, used, we developed this um, extractor turbine. Um, designed by a friend of mine from Herb Arab, um, and it has, it's a lovely uh, turbine, it has a, a starter helix in the middle, and then a vertical axis um, wings on either side, and that sits on a, a centrifugal fan, which just pulls the air out. So its function is just purely for ventilation, to pull the air out of the building. Uh, next. And then, uh, as you said in, in the introduction, uh, the economy collapsed, uh, political crisis. And I got a call from my friend in Melbourne, ex-partner. Um, and he said, come to Melbourne and help us design CH2. Well, Australia was very exciting because I had this passion to see termites in Australia. Now, they are fantastic. Termites in Australia are bigger and better than anywhere. Um, and, you know, you get the, the, the blades that face north-south and, and uh, exist in a wetland. You get the cathedrals that are formed on the outside of the wetland. And these great fins. I mean, look at that building that, that I'm standing in front of, built by termites. It's, it's phenomenal from the point of view of, of thermodynamics. Um, and that is a lung. Uh, you can believe it when you see it. It's fantastic. It's about lungs, about membranes, it's about gas diffusion. <coughs> Next. Um, the climate there was quite different from Zimbabwe. Australia has this, you know, at Melbourne, sorry, Melbourne um, is in the roaring 40s. Uh, so you're getting um, pressure cells moving across the continent from from the west to the east, um, and it switches. The north wind drags hot, dry air off the desert, one of the biggest deserts in the world, uh, and it reaches 46 degrees. And then suddenly it switches. When the next pressure cell comes, you're getting cold air from the south, southern ocean, um, and it drops down to 18 from 46 in about half an hour, usually with an electric storm. Um, so it's very dramatic, uh, and that interval of, of switch is around about three days, and we analyzed this. So this, this was a sort of classic uh, uh, operation, CH2. I was, I, was, uh, I, I was commissioned to do it uh, right from the beginning. Um, and so the first thing we found, we found a, a weatherman um, he was absolutely marvelous. And he gave me this picture. He said, it's quite simple, Melbourne. You have the yellow line, which is comfort level. You have the zigzag. The red dots are the, um, are the high temperatures, the day, and the blue dots are the night. Uh, and you get this three-day cycle. And all you have to do is to predict it. And it's very predictable. I mean, if you... If you, sit, if you uh, phone up and find out what the Adelaide uh, weather is doing, you're going to get it in about a day and a half or a day in Melbourne. So it's very simple, but variable. Um, so that's what we did. That was the whole basis of our strategy for cooling. Next slide shows where, where the site is. Um, we actually started building on, uh, designing on another site and then moved to this one. It's a site that faces north with the, the, the big faces, uh, big facades, north and south. So it was, we were lucky there. Um, it, it very narrow streets, so you get um, a big fall off of light. The light level at the bottom of the street is a good deal less than the, the top of the street. So only about six meters wide, these streets, in, in some cases. Um, and you get very strange winds, turbulent winds. Um, so that's the, the environment the physical environment. Next, um, next slide shows the north elevation of, of the resultant uh, CH2 building. CH2 is council house. 
offices um, and a, a, a shop uh, story at the bottom. Um, they're they're um, open plan offices um, and all for one tenant. Um, that made a big difference uh, compared with Eastgate, which is multi-tenant. Um, now, this, this facade, you see um, chimneys on the outside of the building. We could do that because um, they wanted an open plan inside. They didn't want to be cluttered up with, with things in the middle of the building. Um, so, and, and, and in many ways, I've always wanted to put the um, chimneys on the outside because you can then use the sun. In this case, we use the albedo, that is the reflectivity of the chimney, um, to help um, improve buoyancy inside the chimney. Um, the chimneys also had to get wider as they went up the building because you were pulling air out of each level. Um, and um, that meant you had a bigger, you needed bigger and bigger volumes. And that worked quite well because we realized the windows could get smaller as you went up because there was more light. So there's a sort of, you can read the facade, which is, you know, um, uh, form follows function. Um, and then in between the two, we divided the chimneys, we split them with a deep recessed window. Uh, we set the window back because that window that goes in that slot, uh, we wanted to open at night to cool the building down. Because uh, you saw from the first diagram, the night cooling is very possible in, in Melbourne. It's much colder, it's 37 degrees south, whereas Eastgate is 15 south. So you, you're getting uh, cold, much colder nights. In fact, comfort level normally in Melbourne is, is below, it, it is, it's above the ambient temperature. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's a, a night cooling by natural, uh, by automatic opening windows is possible. Um, and night flush is good. Uh, with with a chimney, um, and because it's in the middle of a city, you've got to air condition. Um, next, oh, and the top, oh, sorry, the top of the chimney are those yellow things, which are turbines, which um, turn out to be more symbolic than functional. Next, um, so there are the two facades: the north side and the south side. South side, the albedo is white, or nearly. Um, because that's the supply air coming down from the top, uh, feeding into each floor, same shape, different color. Um, and the windows are roughly the same. Strangely, we worked out that you were getting more heat off the southern uh, facade uh, than you were from the north. And that's interesting because when you look uh, south in the city, you're getting reflected light off buildings, which is heat and off clouds, which is heat. Um, and looking north, you're getting direct sun. Uh, if you can cope with that, the sky is blue. So you're not actually, you know, the, the um, reflected heat is less. The, the direct heat is more. So you, you, you've got a different condition altogether on the south. And that's reflected in the window design. Um, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the next slide, um, I think you've skipped Oh, no, there we are. Uh, yeah, you've skipped two. That's all right. I'm, I'm now where you are. Um, that, that's on the south facade, uh, there are chartas, which are um, transparent uh, columns with water just cascading through them um, to demonstrate evaporative cooling. Um, and that, that cools the water and the air. So it's. Um, it's, it's really a, a, a more of a demonstration to the public of how evaporative cooling works. Um, the air from that um, it, it is make-up air for the, for the shops at the bottom. And the, the water goes down to the basement, which I think is seen in the next, uh, no, in, in the further slide, I'll explain it. Um, so that's the south facade. The next slide, I think, uh, if you switch, is the west facade. Now that um, uh, has um, opening and shutting louvers made of recycled timber. Um, 
and uh, it opens actually, that, that's um, the Mexican wave um, format. Um, it's, uh, it's hydraulically operated and it opens for most of the day and closes as the sun comes around on this, on this facade about the same speed as the sunflower top right. Um, and it, it, uh, it, it, uh, it, it opens so that you can see the view really. Um, and behind it is a glass wall. Um, next, that's what it looks like from inside. So you can, you can you get a glimpse of the view. The view is very important in, in this part of Melbourne because you need to see out. It's very claustrophobic um, if you can't see out and see what's going on outside. Uh, next. Uh, the next slide shows the open plan floor. Um, and what we did was we put vaults across the space from north to south. Um, you can see the section below. Um, the air is pumped in at the, at the bottom through a hollow floor. It rises up through the floor through um, perforated uh, inlets uh, and is heated by people um, and machines and rises up. It says displacement ventilation. Um, and it is extracted through ducts which run horizontally uh, from the, uh, towards the north side where it goes up the chimneys. Um, underneath the, so you get this wavy slab um, ceiling, exposed concrete ceiling. And below it, on the right hand of the section, you'll see these um, uh, uh, chill panels which are made of aluminium with cold water circulating in them and that it's the whole idea is radiant cooling not cooling with air the air is not recycled it's a hundred percent fresh air all the time so it simply passes through so you're delivering the air at 20 degrees uh, you're not, sometimes we have to cool a little bit with air, but we're trying to avoid that uh, and, and, and keep cooling by radiance. Now the whole idea is, I think the next slide is, is more explicit, um, shows uh, the difference. Top left is normal uh, air conditioning where you drop cold air on top of people's heads and recirculate it six air changes per hour. We do two air changes of 100% fresh air and we do the cooling mainly by, by radiance. Now we, we achieve that by cooling the wavy slab at night by opening windows and the rest of the cooling oh, and, and, and that opening windows and shutting them I'll show you later uh, takes about 20% of the cooling load um, and that's done by nature plus the cost of opening and shutting the windows. Um, and the excess, the rest of the load, cooling load, is, is done by the chill panels, which you'll see on the ceiling. Next. Um, so there's the section through the building. Um, and what we're doing is taking the heat out of the offices, the nine floors of offices, and dumping it in the basement thermal store and recirculating cold air. So we're moving the heat from the offices down into the basement where we have a, a, a thermal store which I'll show you next. And the air, the exhaust air goes up the chimney uh, having, and, and the supply air comes down from above where it is cooled down to 20 degrees or warmed in the winter up to 20 degrees by machines on the roof. And the air going out would be at about 25, 26. Um, okay, the next slide will show you what we, what, what we do with the thermal store. Thermal store, uh, in this case, we're using um, a phase change material encapsulated in steel balls, about the size of a cricket ball. Um, and uh, we, we've got a mixture of salts which freezes at 15 degrees centigrade. You can see the cooling curve uh, on that slide. Um, so it, the, the, um, the, uh, we, we pump water through these vessels 
which are insulated. Uh, the water comes in at, at, at 12 degrees um, and comes out at about 17, um, and having frozen the balls, um, and then uh, back to the offices. So we're dumping heat in them, and then when the uh, diurnal shift, not diurnal, but the three-day shift of temperature changes outside, uh, we switch from um, removing uh, uh, heat to, to, to dumping heat, uh, depending on, on, on what, what's going on outside. So it's, 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 it's really, instead of doing what I was doing in Eastgate very primitively and in the, and in the um, school, um, where we're using stone and concrete as the thermal store, here we're using um, phase change material, much more efficient. Next. Uh, uh, that, that phase change, I can give you a lot of stuff about it if you're interested. Um, then the next slide is about the window design. Um, as you as said before, the, the windows uh, get bigger at the bottom, smaller at the top. They also harvest the, the, the sun um, on the north differently from the south, um, keeping the direct sunlight off. And we worried a lot about glare. Um, and we, 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 we did a lot of simulations of this window. I'm calling it a window, not a glass wall, because that's what it is. It's a window. Um, now you can see in later slides, the next slide shows what it looked like. Um, it's a window with reveals. It's made of timber to stop, um, uh, to, to, to get, uh, uh, the trouble with aluminum um, uh, frames is that they transmit a lot of heat or cool. Um, so um, we, we, we use timber windows and we, you can see at the transom, um, you know, at above at door height level, there are um, uh, beams, chilled beams, which uh, drop a cold curtain in front of the glass. The glass is, is double glazed, uh, low E glass. Um, and at the bottom of the window, you can't see it from this slide, um, is, is a, um, a convector heater uh, for winter. Um, and then uh, we, we, in some of the windows, you can see these tall um, plants placed in front of the, of the glass um, at specific points. That really helps. It's amazing in an office with um, hard surfaces that you're looking at. If you have leaves, it breaks up um, you know, it's 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 all about fractals and about seeing. It, it helps the eyes. It removes eye strain. Um, plants are very very popular in, in, in offices. Very important. And we find instantly that um, in this system of air conditioning, they do not need replacing because the air is fresh and it has the right ionic balance. So there's a lot of positives um, about plants, it, it will tell you whether the air conditioning system is working properly or not. Uh, you can also see in this slide, I think in the next one, the ceiling panels. Okay, next. Um, yeah, there's a bigger slide showing the ceiling panels and the wavy ceiling above. And then the, de the lighting system is right down to 140 lux um, with task lights um, at the desks, seven watt task lights, 14 lux watt. Uh, T5s. Um, all, the, all the materials are recycled, etc., etc. Um, next. Um, the next slide shows how um, we the, the window opens at night automatically. Um, it is quite expensive that the, the window, the cost of the windows and the automatic openings was almost the same as a cooler, a chiller. Um, and and it's it certainly um, is a, as effective. So there's no saving doing this, but uh, in, in in the capital cost, but certainly is in the running cost. Uh, I think the next slide shows the resultant. Uh, uh, that, that's the that's a good picture. The blue line is the is the shift in, in the three day cycle of Melbourne's temperature. Um, the red line is the slab temperature 
and the dark blue is the resultant indoor temperature, um, which we have um, kind of doctored to, to remove the benefit of other systems. So that we're trying to identify what effect the slab has and opening and shutting windows has on the, on the total. And it was giving us about a 20% um, uh, cooling load um, advantage. Now, the, the, the red peaks at the bottom show when we open the windows and when we don't open the windows when the temperature gets too hot. So it, it's simply controlled um, by thermostat so that when the air temperature Can you? Oh, good. I'll carry on then. Can you see the slide? Okay. That, uh, okay. Blackboard treatment. Okay. Look, that's, that's uh, we're taking water out of the sewer and, and filtering it by, um, uh, by membrane, membranes only, um, and getting A-grade water. It was a long battle. It took about three years to get it right, but we're now getting A-grade water out of the sewer. Uh, in the streets, well worth doing. Um, you can you can save huge amounts of water that way. It's about a hundred thousand liters of water saved every every day. Okay, uh, and and so we've got two waters in this building. Uh, we've got uh, A grade water from sewer, which we use for cooling and for uh, flushing toilets and and plants, and we use um, town water for for the rest. Uh, next is simply um, we're using a capstone generator from, from, from America, which is a gas turbine um, for, for power and heating. Uh, next. Um, the, the next slides, are, are, are you there on, on the, ce the, ce the ceiling units? Okay. Um, just to show you um, the pre building process, we had to, we had um, huge cranage there. Um, these are, 10 ton uh, slabs. Okay, and I'll just show you then that was quick, quickly done. Quite a job making these because the surface had to be um, roughened um, to remove heat from concrete. You don't need a smooth surface, you need a roughened surface to get turbinate air to remove the heat from it. So we had to spend quite a lot of time um, fooling around with, with textures. Uh, next. I think that's explained. And finally, do you, do you get the bird in, in the nest? Okay, just to show that animals uh, are quite happy with CH2. Next. Um, and so, um, when I, and the next slide shows, 92, shows the 200 bedroom six star hotel for the pigeons of Melbourne. Um, that was the result of my campaign to save the pigeons. I don't like the idea of them calling them rats of the sky and all this stuff. What, what you do with pigeons in a city is to manage them properly. Um, if you want to know more about that, I'll tell you. <laughs> but but this, this worked quite well. It, it, it's a hotel for pigeons. Um, next slide. I'm, I'm going a bit fast because I see the times are getting on. It's 10, 10 to 10. Um, uh, this uh, sculpture. Um, inspired a lot of things and it's in the bottom of CH2 and it's two vortexes spinning away. Um, now, um, it, it's, it, the next bits are really about symbolic form. Uh, I've always been worried about this problem of form and function um, and, and form and sculpture. I don't like what I see being built around me all the time which I think is, is sculpture and not, not architecture. But anyway, uh, th this is uh, about um, a Hindu temple which I designed in, in Harare. 
And I think it probably came from the next slide, which are these wonderful marsh um, dwellings in, in uh, Iran, Iraq. Uh, are you there? Um, and the buildings that resulted from them. Um, now, my building, which was built in Harare, is made of brick. Next slide. And there's some sections through it, which you can look at. And you can see the temple. The temple is, so it's all about symbolic form. And it has its place. This, this, is, this is very much um, what, what people um, respect and, and love. And it's about, it's, these are cultural forms. Um, and I respect them. I completely respect them. I try and get as close to the, the shape as possible with, with whatever material. Okay? Um, but it fascinates me, the Hindu religion. I got really deep into it um, uh, because it's very close to nature. And that's a whole new story. A new chapter for me was, was about Hindu. Now, um, I then I've got a slide which says, in their pursuit of the narrow conception of architecture, as, uh, as the construction of sculptural form, modern architects have denied the physical link between the occupier and habitat and made it difficult for people to engage in their habitat as agents of change. Sorry, that sounds like a very uh, a whole lecture in itself, but um, uh, I, it, it, it introduces this problem of, of, um, of uh, symbolic form. And in the next slide, which and you're looking down uh, a vortex, right? And the next one is how we try to. I actually taught myself AutoCAD at the stage because I was trying to draw this damn thing and make it into a building, okay? Which is the next slide. And then finally, uh, there's a picture, an aerial picture of the shell in a lake. And, and you're looking over an enormous plant which takes awful water out of a paper mill and, uh, and treats it and puts it back into the system as pure water. Now, I, I was engaged to do this building as a visitor's center. Um, and um, I didn't get on very well with the process engineers who were doing the plant uh, because they didn't like uh, nature very much. <laughs> um, they wanted to do it. I mean, they were. They made a clear distinction between uh, the, the nature. I actually said to them, "Why don't you use bamboo instead of all this plant?" Uh, and that that wasn't the right thing to say. Um, anyway, um, this building, uh, which looked like a shell, you'll see next um, in the next slide, was a, a lake, a, a building on a lake. Okay, and. It's, uh, the idea is that water runs over the shell and by back radiation it's cooled at night. The water then falls into the lake <coughs> and the lake then um, cools the building. Okay? In other words, there's a next slide showing it. Uh, now, um, I, I parted uh, not on very, very good terms with the engineers. Um, and, and the building was left in a bit of a mess. But what, 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 what there was of it was finished. And um, the architects in Australia thought it was wonderful and started giving it prizes. And then the engineers realized that they actually had something here. So um, it's now being doled up and it's properly finished off now. Uh, and it's, it got into one of, in one of the magazines. And the magazine article is actually very interesting. Because uh, it's and it's well worth getting actually. It's it's very amusing because what's happened is that the wild ducks have uh, moved in underneath the building um, and taken uh, and, and found it very good. Now they the thing is that the building sits on a lake, and between the floor of the building and the lake water is a cleaner, uh, and that's the air that's cooled, and that's circulated uh, in the building. Um, now, the ducks found this out by swimming underneath the, the seal uh, and, and they, they nest in there. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite comical now. You'll just see slides of that. Uh, next one, you can see this thing sitting in the water. 
it works fine actually in the end uh, after um, I think the engineers have, have, have left but they we just didn't get on actually there, there was a problem um, but now it's it's it turned out to be quite a success you can see the inside the building I mean when you <coughs> build a form that copies nature it was obviously copying a shell you end up rather like the hermit crab having to cram yourself into a form which doesn't necessarily fit with what you're trying to do but it has other aspects to it um, okay um, and uh, now isn't that great isn't isn't that isn't that where we want to be I mean there is the perfect city on, on water and it what 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 I found out from that last project was that actually living on water is the perfect moderator. If you could put all your cities on water, um, you wouldn't have any problems with, with heating and cooling. Okay? And so the next slide, Vietnam, um, Holland. There are lots of examples in America too of this, and in Canada, of living on water. Uh, Holland, uh, are you there in 110? Now they're making houses in factories and floating them out into the polders. Uh, they can't build on any more land in Holland because it's too valuable. Um, and it's such a brilliant idea. There are at least 4,000 of these houses now in Holland. Uh, next slide shows how they build, they put the house on the river and keep the garden on the land instead of occupying land with a house. Um, okay, now I'm I'm at Vanky, right? That that's a, a plan um, of a, 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 a sort of wetland. Okay, um, now I'll explain it because it's actually a tower. The tower is is you're looking on top of. It's a plan of a tower, really, um, and the tower is a 36-story building. Uh, open structure and it, we're using it for testing equipment and at the top we're putting in four turbines now the next slide uh, that's a sort of my, my drawing of it the next slide shows where it is and actually this morning it was hit by lightning um, and the poor men are trying to work up there at the moment that's what it's looking like at the moment now it, it's a very daring thing because they're building six, 36 story uh, buildings all over China at the moment. I mean, this company I'm working for uh, builds 150,000 apartments a year. Can you imagine that? It's bigger than anything that's ever happened. And they're working in 56 cities. So they need to do proper research on high rise living. And the purpose of this tower, it's actually a laboratory for testing out windows, all sorts of things we're going to be testing, including equipment um, with gravity and, and wind and all, all sorts of things. So that's very exciting. Um, next slide shows a container turned up on end, right? 12-foot container, 12-meter container. Now, I built a, a dining hall, which you can see in the next slide, called, looks like Stonehenge, right? Uh, by putting these containers um, to form a, a, a vault, uh, arches, okay, like that. Um, and you can see the section there. And that's what it looks like. That's where I had breakfast this morning. It's got a roof garden, a roof garden an array of, um, of hot water that tube, I mean, you can get anything in China. It's a fantastic country. Right? They're making anything. Some of it's crap, <laughs> but, a lot, but a lot of it's fantastically good. In fact, the Chinese can make anything, uh, but you've got to ask for it right. <laughs> if you get it right, get the asking right, you get exactly what you want. So this is a building made of containers. It has um, a system of collecting hot water on the roof which we then put through a, um, a heat pump uh, to power an absorption chiller, which makes cold water at 12 degrees. And very briefly, that powers 
um, cooling by slab, slab cooling, um, and also um, beam cooling, but also a water wall. Um, and the water wall, sorry, I'm just going through these slides quite quickly now. Um, there, there's a, a facade looking over the lake, um, and, and you can see the other sides of it. Um, now, in, if you get the internal shot, you can, see, you can see the water wall. Now, that water wall is a dehumidifier. Um, and it's, it, this climate is rather like New Orleans, actually. It's, um, it's hot and wet. Uh, but, the, but if you run, you, you can see the servery there with water running, running over. Okay, that water is at 12 degrees. It's absorbing water from the air. So it's dehumidifying. Um, and it works fine. Um, okay, and circulating. That's what I wanted to show you. Uh, just go through those slides and you see the roof garden. Uh, not all that successful. I've got new uh, design for roof gardens now, having tried that one. Um, okay, well that's, that's, and you can see the pipes in, in the construction. Um, and finally, I'm just the last set of slides is the tropical greenhouse. Um, you may wonder why we're doing a tropical greenhouse in a subtropical place on the east coast of China, um, mimicking the Yunnan rainforest. It's turning out to be a fantastically interesting job because we're reconstructing the whole ecosystem with the carbon cycle, the mineral cycle, the water cycle, and the energy flow and social dynamics. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing um, project. Um, and I've just thrown in some slides there um, showing you what, what, what we're trying to do. Um, and also, uh, we're, we're going to actually get bromeliads and, and make clouds in this, in this greenhouse um, to show that whole process. Um, and and I've, I've given you a lot of stuff about how clouds are formed in the in the Yunnan. Look, I don't want to um, occupy more of, my, of your time because we must have a bit of time for questions. Okay. Okay. That's better. Yeah, I can see you. That's it. Now you got me. I'm sorry, yeah. How, how do the people working at Council House 2, are they happy in their environment? I'll send Kimberly uh, an independent bit of research done by, um, by um, a group from London. Um, it's, it's really quite successful. They particularly like the air conditioning system. They complained a lot about the lighting level to begin with. Um, and we had to make some improvements. Um, I think we... Uh, we didn't... Well, I can't... Uh, that the so there were complaints about lighting levels. Can you replace that? Um, but we've got that right now, I think. Sorry, are you still there? Yeah, we're still here. Can you repeat the last think, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Are you, are you there again? Hello? Yeah, he's born in the 38. He rides his bike every day. Oh. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hello. I think yeah. technology is going to cut short. I think turn, probably turn, turn, turn off your video. Okay. Turn off your video. All right. And, and, and we'll just do it by, by conversation. I think it'll work fine, actually. Okay. It's, it, the, the video is just too much for the, for the bandwidth, I think. Yeah, all the Chinese gamers are waking up and logging on, I guess. That's right. Um, so, I have a question for you. When, how closely did you have to work with you know, engineers, thermodynamics, and you know, people who specialize in that thing, uh, versus how much freedom you had to design? I, I work very closely with engineers. In fact, I, I insist on having the first meeting with the engineers. Um, I need. To, I, I find that um, uh, I, I need to get them really excited about holistic um, science. Um, unfortunately, our science is, is is not holistic yet. It's getting there. Um, so I get people very interested about um, uh, really seeing all sorts of other sides to the problem. Um, and, and get them in the team. So, with, with both CH2 and Eastgate, we had the engineers in on the first day before I started drawing anything. We had, in CH2, we actually had two weeks in which we met in the same room for six hours every day. And we had uh, three artists. We had the um, client, uh, we had the facilities manager, we had a builder, and we had the engineers, all the engineers, and, and architect, the architect's team. So it was a full team for two weeks. It was absolute hell, actually, but we, we ended up um, with the same vision of the building in our heads. So I think, I think it's, it, it, it's one way of doing it, but it's, it's, it's certainly worth doing. I mean, I, I like to try and bring, it, bring that full team together right at the beginning. Um, to, to get to get the the whole picture in, 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 in people said it saves enormous amounts of time and later. Our audio feeds actually if you can do it. Um, but, um, yeah. Did you get some of that? Yeah we did. We got most of it. I think um, the technology is gonna cut us short on this one. Thank you so much for your time on behalf of everyone here at the University of Oregon. We appreciate you greatly. Okay. And good luck okay. in all your future endeavors. Okay. Okay, Kim. Good. Right. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right.